and and then you have the hotel, which the hotel itself is really cool to walk through. Oh yeah, yeah. So all the things. If you haven't been to the Artisan Hotel, Gothic and boobs. <laughs> Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local music scene and the people that make it, including me and this guy. I met my guest at the Homegrown Songwriter Showcase run by Halsabar over at the Artisan Hotel. It just started at time of recording last Wednesday, and uh, Hal was nice enough to ask me to live stream it and review the performances, which uh, at uh, time of recording was today. So when you're done here, go check that one out. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed, which consider doing that, click down there. I'd appreciate it. Uh, but first, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Mm. Ooh, it's like cough syrupy. So I have... A this is a thick throat coat. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. I don't know if I want to sing after it or before it. Yeah. <laughs> so this was peanutty peanut butter whiskey. My wife thought it'd be funny. She gave me a couple peanut butter whiskeys. And my guest decided, well, let's crack that open. Speaking of my guest, he has had quite the interesting journey. Uh, in three months, he went from knowing three chords on guitar to sharing the red carpet with Robin Thicke. He's won a Hollywood Music and Media Award and had his music played at Burning Man during Exodus. He has a book and an album, both named The Journey Home, and he's called, he has an audiobook as well. I've got links down in the description for that. In this book and album... Take the audience on a trip through the ups and downs of his life, would it be fair to say? I would say that. Right on. On the way to a life of healing and true purpose. Self-described as a father, singer, songwriter, soul healer, sound shaman, and transformational alchemist, please welcome to the show, Carl John. Say hi. Hello. That was a wonderful uh, intro. I did my best. <laughs> Officially again, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Clink. And if you're drinking at home, that's two. <laughs> mm. So, speaking of your book, let's get this out of the way real quick. Okay. He was nice enough to gift me with a book. And one of the originals. One of the original copies. It's autographed. So I will frame this. I will put this in carbonite. <laughs> <My geeky show. laughs> but also inside the book, he has a nice card here with uh, the audiobook link to uh, Audible, Spotify, Audible. iTunes, and Amazon. Mm -hmm. Nice. A coupon code. Ooh. Can I tell them the coupon code? I don't even know if it works. <laughs> nice. No, it should it should still work. But right. yeah, when you when you have it in the book, I give people the the audio book link as well. Nice. Um, you can get this and more at uh, here carljohn.com. Carljohn. Yes. Um, incidentally, I've got links to all his social media as well. Like I said. So, right off the bat, I wanted to say. We met, like I said, at the uh, the showcase. What did you think about that whole the whole situation and playing at the Artisan Hotel Lounge and and um, just the vibe of that particular show? It was really cool. I actually didn't know what to expect. I've been to the Artisan a couple times, um, you know, at various times of night, various <laughs> occasions. But you know, I've seen DJs and everything else there, and I didn't know really what to expect in the setup of. Uh, live acoustic performance, but I thought it was really a cool vibe. I agree. You know, I think Hal did a great job, fantastic of, job of making it into a thing. Um, if you've seen the video, you know that the stage is basically like open behind you. There isn't a wall. There's a picture frame basically yeah. suspended. And I was looking at it going like, it seems, it's kind of like playing in the round, except what's behind you is the VIP section that nobody was in. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I know what you mean about the DJs thing. Uh, I went in to scout, you know, uh, because he was nice enough to ask me to live stream and also, uh, you know, review, which means me taking pictures and stuff. I, I went in to scout it, and it was a Friday night, and DJ. And nobody was dancing. There was people at the bar, some people hanging out, like you do at a club when it's, not, you know, you're trying too hard, basically, kind of thing. Mm. But uh, DJ, bless his heart... <laughs> It was like, yeah, let's go, people, and, and doing the whole the whole bit, but it didn't feel right in there. Mm. 
the showcase feels right in there. Yeah, it felt really cool. The way they had the table set up and everything. It's like I really dug the space. Yeah, and, and um, I love that the, there's a patio on the back for the people that want to smoke or just get, you know get some air or whatever. And, and then you have the hotel, which the hotel itself is really cool to walk through. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so all the things. if you haven't been to the Artisan Hotel, Gothic and boobs. <laughs> and Gothic well, boobs. Yeah, it, it's an adults-only hotel, meaning that they have lots of art. They have lots of replicas of, of famous artwork, and a lot of it has, you know, topless women in it. But it's, uh, you know, the pool is actually topless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. sadly, no one. Was There's a lot of sexy time there. Sexy Garrison. time. It seems that place only seems right at night. I wouldn't. Ah! I wouldn't go there at noon. It'd just be weird. <laughs> There's a lot of places in Las Vegas I wouldn't go at noon. It'd oh, be weird. The Strip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I remember my first time in Vegas uh, as a like by myself. I came with my mom when uh, like just you know. We're going to, we're driving three hours to go to Las Vegas. We're going to play penny and quarter slots or penny and nickel slots. We're going home. And that was it. You know, yeah, as a kid, yeah. as a kid. My first time as a, as a of age grown up who could legally be in the casinos walking the floor, I came out in the morning to, to the strip and I was just like, ugh. <laughs> ugh. Vegas is definitely um, one of those towns that has two different sides. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Has yeah. all the sides. Yeah, 360 degrees of us. So I was wondering, I wanted to get your take. I know that you're a Johnny Cash fan. Sure. Yeah. Well, based on some of your posts, it seems like you're a big Johnny Cash fan. You vibe with that. I would describe some of your music almost as being, this is going to sound a little weird, but uh, particularly your song, We Are One. Yeah. I got Jason Mraz vibes musically yeah. and Johnny Cash or Tom Waits vibes uh, vocally or lyrically. Like they were somehow singing together. That's cool. And and but I was wondering what would you what do you think Johnny Cash would think about singer songwriters today and the the whole just I don't want to say industry but that that whole scene what would he think yeah. I have no clue I, I think like you know I think anybody who's saying something you know there would be respect in that you know um, anybody who's trying to put their soul out there. And says what's within them, mm -hmm. you know. I think Johnny Cash would respect. I don't even. I don't even think it matters the uh, the genre or anything else. I mean, you know, he did cover "Hurt" by Nine Inch Nails, and it's Still, like owned that in a way that yeah. it was like I spilled my my soul out and said it in a way that is authentic. And I think as a songwriter, that's why you can cover someone else's stuff. Like I don't do covers, right? right? Because even if I cover someone else's written material, it's still me. It's still my way of doing it. Right. It's still, it's not just a, a cut. I just don't do those. It's from jump, I never really did that. And um, I think that, you know, when you resonate with it, it still becomes your own. And I think that's like, you know, a beauty of, you know, songwriting. And, and I think, you know, someone like Johnny Cash was somebody who covered other people's music but made it his own and he had wrote his own stuff as well. You know, and so it was still Johnny Cash showed up. Yep. I I, I have to agree with you. Um, it It is, there is, I don't want to say this without offending too many people. There are two ways you can do covers. There's, uh, this is my take of this cover, and there's corporate gig. <laughs> you know, sure. this is what people expect to hear. And yeah, his version of Hurt still is just one of those, like, Trent Reznor should have been like, that's how I should have done it. <laughs> Well, yeah, and they were both. I mean, they both were authentic. And Trent Reznor yeah. couldn't have done it that way because Trent Reznor wasn't coming to the end of his life and saying it in a way that twisted the knife. Oh God, yeah. And it's like you have to you have to have lived that shit to make to sell that through because people know the difference. Yeah. Um, you you ever hear what uh, Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson what the stuff they did together? Like seven. Um, well, the, yeah, when uh, the, like uh, Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson and, and Cash yeah. and all those guys were doing this, the, the outlaw type yeah. stuff. Yeah, I've heard some of their stuff back then. Right on. Yeah. Uh, moving on. What qualifies to you as Native Americana? Native American. Well, interesting. That was a term that was given to me. Um, I recorded a song with Robert Mirabal. Robert Mirabal is a uh, sound shaman. Uh, from Taos Pueblo, multi Grammy award winning, carved. You know his flutes are in the Smithsonian. 
you know, um, and he recorded with me on one of my tracks that I wrote. Um, and we were in the studio and we were in Taos, New Mexico mm -hmm. recording this. And the, one of the engineers there said, CJ, what, and so my friends call me CJ, Carl John. <laughs> um, it says, what, how would you describe your music? I said, you know, country Americana, singer, songwriter, and Robert's the one who turned around and said, he said, Native Americana, you have a native spirit. And, and that just kind of stuck with me because it, it made me want to make sure that when I take the mic and I say something, mm -hmm. I say something. Right. Now, you're not, uh, as far as Native American heritage. Uh, not even blood. Heritage, yeah. Yeah. Blood, thank you. Yeah. Um, because I... I that's my soul kind yeah. of came alive. Um, yeah. you, you just answered two questions for me, though. One was, what's this Native Americana? I don't think he's Native American. Where did that come from? So that answers that. But also, the Taos thing. I forgot Taos is a place. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at going like, like you know, Tao, like in you know, yeah. Chinese. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm looking at going like, wow, Taos, Taos. Why do I know that? And I'm thinking it's like a philosophy or, you know, a, a school of learning or something. And, and totally miss the fact that, you know, you're just talking about a freaking place in, in New Mexico. Right, 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 right. <laughs> awesome. Um, now, you you uh, you once said being a father is not a job. is a job I didn't plan or train for. Mm-hmm. Are your kids still happy hippies, or has teenager itis hit? <laughs> has teenager itis hit? And how do they feel about dad trying to hold on to his rock star dreams? <laughs> I don't have rock star dreams. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> but my 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 daughters, uh, they have a they have a huh, a hippie soul in them, mm -hmm. both of them, because they couldn't help but have that. Because <laughs> as they grew up, is when I went through my transition. You know, mm -hmm. I used to be. You know, somebody who wore Armani suits, popping collars. I was a real estate developer, financier, had a gaming lounge restaurant out here. And, oh, wow. And, what was uh, the name of that lounge? Vox Wine Lounge. <laughs> Sorry. We'll, uh, we'll talk about <laughs> Yeah. So that, uh, um, you know, and I was involved in the arts district and all these things, you know, early on. And I, but I wasn't an artist. I didn't play music and anything else. And I picked up guitar primarily in Taos, New Mexico. Those are the three chords I knew, really. And I remember watching the Dwight Yoakam video and going like, I, I can play that chord. I can play. And he's saying, I was like, I can actually play this and do this. And, and so that led to the other. And I took a downturn when the economy took a crash, yeah. lost millions of dollars. Like, you know, uh, you know, went through divorce, custody battle. And went like, I've already done this route. I want to try something in this route. And had some things show up in my world that put me forward in that. Back to your question about my daughters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're hippies because, in, in a way, because of their way of seeing the world and others and everything else because they've only known me going through this path of spiritual development and growth in my own way, so they couldn't help but rub off on them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Teenager is a teenager is a teenager and a teenage girl yeah. has all the things happening and I've been through the the the, the, the ringer mm -hmm. with them for sure. Yeah, um, he just met my daughter. She's fourteen and decided, knowing I have an interview, decided I want a quesadilla right now. She came down and made a quesadilla and and left and it was just like, okay, I'm not going to argue with her. <laughs> Caitlin Taggart was a beautiful, lively girl who loved laughing and playing outside, but all that changed at the age of 12. Caitlin slipped into a persistent vegetative state, confining her almost entirely to her bed and Facebook. What would you tell other parents? I want parents out there to go home tonight and hug their kids and be thankful they don't have such a piss poor attitude. <laughs> that's like something my, my kids would do like lights cameras it's like you know there's things going on around right. you right <laughs> that's why I try not to have like concerts here or something <laughs> she'd be like I want to go swimming yeah <laughs> alright um, so you actually uh, touched on you know uh, that, that I can do that moment yeah. and that leads me to one of my usual interview questions which is let's talk about influences what was your earliest musical influence and it was what you said right my early, yeah, my earliest. What was the thing that said I could do that or I want to do that? Well, you know, the funny thing is, when I was a kid, there's there's some stuff I found recently uh, in my parents' house where I wrote things when I was like in second grade and kindergarten, oh, wow. who I wanted to be when I grew up, and it was all these things that, and it was like music was a big part of that, 
and I've always been on the outskirts. That's why I got involved in, you know, helping with do the arts district out here in Las Vegas and, and being involved in first Fridays and like, you know, booking bands and doing these things in my life to be in the peripheral. I never saw that in myself, right? Never thought I had a voice until somebody said something one day. Mm -hmm. And it was like, um, my earliest influences, you know, like Kiss was huge when I was a kid. My first album Same. was Kiss Rock and Roll S Over. Same. I remember jumping up and down on a couch at like, I was probably like five or six years old. Yeah. My brother Drew, who's nine years older than me, was was showing me, you know, here's, here's what rock and roll sounds like. Here's Kiss. Yeah. 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 And then, and then you know, my, my mom was in the country and that... At that time, so I got influenced by a lot of the country singer songwriters like Willie Nelson and all that, and, and um, you know, like Jim Croce and Cat Stevens and all these cats. Growing up, that it was like the storytellers, mm -hmm. you know, those are always the ones that resonated with me. It felt like, and then you know, as I got older, it's like you know, Nikki Six and Motley Crue. It's like going full out and balls to the wall and just like. You know, saying something in different ways. So me, I consider myself, I'm more of a lyricist. Mm -hmm. So like when I co-write with somebody, it's a lot of times if it's, you know, somebody who has more influence musically, because my box is like this here, you know, right. but it feels like lyrically my box is more here, maybe. I can see that. You know, and, um, and when I, so I team up with others, that's when it's cool to write for other people in mind. Like, oh, I wrote this song. It's not, it's not a Carl John song though. Right. Right. But yeah. do that all day long. You know, I'm hearing it this way. I'm hearing it with this female vocal. I'm hearing it with this thump. I'm hearing it with this swagger in it. Because, you know, I also was influenced by hip hop. You know, I used to break dance. I used to really? Break. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's all of these things that are in there that I want to express. And that's why I have like, you know, 400 sound files on here. And it's like different, there's different things. And it's like, so when you get together and you can really, Dub, it's like, oh, we can create this and create that and create, but to say something, try to say something. It's like, I, you know, right? Whatever. Well, getting well, touching on your sto uh, storytelling mm. and hip hop, like I miss storytelling hip hop. I miss Cool Modi. Oh, yeah, I miss yeah. y you know Young L O Cool J, and I miss you know uh, K R S One. I like I saw the first episode of Yo MTV Raps. <laughs> nice, <laughs> but I remember when you know uh, it, it was you were telling a story about what was going on. Yeah, yeah. But in a different way than, say, a singer-songwriter was, or a folk singer. Right. Yeah. Um, which leads me to, many people find that making music changes their perspective, perspective on who they are and their place in the world, and your journey seems to be the opposite. Like, you, you came to it later in life than a lot of people do in terms of, oh, I can do this, and, and this is what, you know, this is who I am now. And like you said, you went, you were, you were this Carl John, and then you became this Carl John. Right, right, right. Uh, am I am I correct in the assessment? Um, yeah, I better became that later in life. Yeah, like it, it seems like your journey is the opposite of a lot of people who came to music and said, "Oh, this is, you know, music has, has changed me," and then after that, they started being grown ups or whatever. Yeah. You know? yeah. And mine my, my was totally the opposite. And so it was challenging in a lot of ways, you know. Um, and, you know, but I had this other side of me as well that was, you know, business guy, you know, all right. And so it was coming to bring that into balance. Right. Because I went completely this direction. I don't want any of this anymore. And then it's like bringing it back here because this is a part of me as well. Mm -hmm. And how can all of this blend together? That became my life. Exactly. Yeah. I, uh, I, 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 different point in my life, but I went through some of the same as you where I was like, you really, the hardest thing to figure out is who, who am I? Who are you really? When you strip away what people know about you at work, what people know about you through whatever. And I was able to figure out, not 19 years old. I'm a performer. In that, I tend to fill in, uh, fill in vacuums. If if people are talking, I tend to sit back, and then if there's a, you know not a lot of talking going on, I might tend to speak up. Uh, and also musically, I figured out you know, like you said, somebody finally said something, and I believed them. Mm -hmm. Like oh, I do have something to contribute. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I maybe I am good enough to bother getting on stage or <sighs> getting paid for it. Hey. Um, and the same with the YouTube thing. It's all that 
getting over yourself and getting over the imposter syndrome that this this society likes to make you feel because I, you know, well, they're a celebrity. Yeah, but they were me when they started kind of thing. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> but, all right. Um, another usual interview question. Um, we talked about earliest influence. I was wondering, let's talk favorite show memory. Okay. That you've played. I played? Yeah. Okay. That you've played... And uh, you either were you were you ever a part of a band? I've never been part of a band. I've okay. never. I've 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 had uh, um, band guys behind me. You okay. Know. You've had a band, but yeah, not. yeah, yeah. It's not, you know I've never had a steady band. I've never had okay. that sort of thing. All right. Well, what I was wondering, do you have a favorite show memory? Whether it's incredibly bad and somebody ended up in jail, or you, you know, it was was it playing with Robin Thicke? No. Well, and that was that was an interesting thing because I pulled that shit together in ten minutes, man, because it was like. Um, I, I got the gig and I hadn't written an original song yet and I had to have two songs for this show and I just released my first song which was Fallen and Flying uh, that I did uh, Jamie, Lee Wilson, uh, Jamie Lee Wilson's on that track who's an amazing singer-songwriter out of the Texas music scene and you know I, that book got me that gig and then I had to do two songs and Heart Like a Wheel became that song out of necessity and it was about my journey you know, in the beginning of my book, and you'll hear it. But uh, um, so you opened up for Robin Thicke. Is that yeah, what yeah. It was a, it was a big, it was a big gala at uh, um, the Venetian Hotel, and it was like a big red carpet type of thing. Nice. And it was it, me and like two. There were two other artists. One was this uh, woman from Nine Hundred Two One Zero who had a thing at the time, and then this other band who had a lot of uh, pop hit at the time. And so, yeah, so I went out and did those, those two songs, but that was, so that was memorable because obviously it was like, I went from nothing to like doing this thing where people are taking pictures and calling out my name and shit. And it was like, whoa, you know? And, uh, but I've had some interesting ones. When I first went to Nashville, I was, uh, uh, working with a guy who produced a couple tracks on that album and his guitar player at the time, and it was the first time I ever played in, in Nashville was uh john osborne from um, the band brothers osborne oh yeah yeah so john was my first backing guitar player nice and ray stevenson was my uh you know was uh, the one who brought me i just wanted to produce uh, those tracks and so that was like my first time in nashville <clears throat> and then later uh i did a show out there that i stepped up and did a handful of songs and i i like i said don't do many covers and if i do any it's something i'm gonna cover in my way right and so i picked a you know a few country ones that i had been doing over time and <laughs> this guy came up big dude and he says uh you know any george Strait?" and i was like <laughs> nope yeah no i knew oh. one ah. i knew the song <laughs> cheyenne right nice and so i did it my way and he goes fuck yeah and he throws a 20 in the bucket and and my buddy ray goes you know who that is and I said, I said, nah. He goes, his dad managed to trade that his dad wrote that song. So that's like that's oh, Nashville. Wow. Right? And so it was like it was like that sort of thing, man. It's like I've been I've been thrown out in like you want to talk imposter syndrome. Yeah. It's like I do not belong here right now. Yeah. I've played with a band a few times and I'm walking the red carpet to do this thing to play with a band tonight. Yeah. But this is me, man. I'm gonna own this shit in this moment. In this moment. And that's and that's the difference. New that musicians, moment. that's the only thing you can do is fake it till you make it. And and when the, you find yourself in a situation where you feel like, ah, that's when you have to basically tell yourself, suck it up and do it. Like, do it or you're going to regret it. Yeah. <laughs> truly. Truly. That's awesome. Because I was, I, I saw you were, you know, walking through the car, you, you, you shared the bill basically with Robin Thicke. And I was like, I am not know Robin Thicke's music. <laughs> and I heard your music. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like it was it like four different forms yeah, of types of it music. It sounds like it. So yeah. it was more of a. This was in Nashville. No, it was out here. It was oh, Venetian. it was here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it, you it said was that. A Venetian Hotel. Yeah. So this was kind of a big. So you were the local. Gala. You were the local support. <laughs> I don't know how that worked out, but it was. Uh, it's the right place, right time. It, it was. Yeah. It was. You know, I just put out that first song, and I got offered this thing and they liked it when they ran it up the the ladder over there and yeah that was me man nice so you know i just came on balls out as <laughs> they say you know nice nice um 
So that's a really good show memory. Uh, I want to talk about favorite Vegas venues. Do you have a favorite Vegas venue, whether playing or, or seeing music? You could say the artist. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, actually, the artist is pretty dope to do that type of uh, singer-songwriter thing. I, gotta say, um, yeah. I like it. I like it, too, because, you know, a lot of singer-songwriters out here that are, you know, they do the majority of cover things. Or whatever, and they're playing, you know, the places to pay them or the, you know, places that have TV screens on they're behind in the corner them and, and all of that. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like to have a vibey place, you know, is pretty cool. Any of those. I think, you know, the, the great thing about Las Vegas is there's so many amazing venues to see artists out here. And there's so many artists to come through. Yeah. And all of these venues have such great production quality, sound quality, all of that, yeah. that it's just like I've not seen very many bad shows. And there's, there's so many places that just pop up left and right that it's, you know, in one year it's different than the next year. And it's like there's no other town like it, man. Weirdest place, weirdest place I've ever seen have live music is, should you not, I come out of, the, I come out of my gym and I hear saxophone music, which is weird, you know, like a strip mall kind of thing. I know there's no bar or anything where live music would be. There's a Chuck E. Cheese, there's a CVS. I'm like looking around and across the parking lot is a honey baked ham and they're having a jazz night with some sax guy. And there's a line out the door. I didn't recognize his name, but I was just like, how do you get that gig? Right? Honey baked ham of all places. It, it must have been a, I, the owner or something. Some kind of thing. I, yeah. I just am like, put that on your resume. <laughs> Play the honey baked ham on the you know? sunset. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got a ham out of it. And I was hungry. What do you want me to do? You Damn. know, I've done more for less. But yeah, that was definitely, <laughs> that was one of the weird ones out of Weirdest show I ever I ever played myself. I've played. Uh, I did a four hour cover gig on the end of a barge. Nice. <laughs> Colville Bay Marina out of Lake Mead. They the little metal flat bottom skip. We're all hanging on to our gear, going out to this little island that somebody had, and they all these houseboats, and they just ran an electric extension cord all the way from one boat to another until it got to us, and we had. I I'm, I'm the front man. Floodlights on the beach, right in my face. And we're playing, and they paid us well, and and then we had to ride back, <laughs> and it was sketchy, but it was it was weird, and it was one of those. Who could say that? Who could say I played in the end of a barge, beach on the island? No kidding. Yeah, <laughs> that was cool. Um, all right, what is the shadow of the whip? What is the shadow of the whip? Yeah, it's when you you screw up certain aspects of your life yourself. Um. You do the thing that creates karmic debt mm. in your life, and you have to pay the piper at some point, because it always comes around, and it comes around in ways you don't really expect, and that's what true karma is. It's not like you know the way a lot of people uh, understand it to be, and it comes in many other ways that you reap what you sow, and at some point in your life. Like you've been smacked enough, yeah, right, that you fear the shadow of the whip. You don't have to feel the sting. Gotcha, gotcha. And you know, I sense it coming, and I don't need to go there yeah. anymore. I've gone there enough. That yeah, you can call it your conscience. You can call it that you know experience or, or that that little voice in the back of your head. Just say, hey, buddy, remember that time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and time. you adhere, you you learn to adhere to that. You learn yeah. to like honor that <clears throat> voice as real. One of the one of the best sentences I've heard, and I, I tend to apply it. The lessons we learn are the painful and expensive ones. Hmm. The one they cost you in some way, or they're painful, or both. Those are the ones that make you fear the shadow of the whip. Yeah. But I, I saw you, you posted. Uh, Something about like fearing the shadow of the whip or, or trying to avoid the shadow of the whip. Mm. And I was like, what is the shadow of the whip? And now I get it. I was focusing on the shadow part, less cool. of the whip. Yeah. But um, that, is a, that is a great, great statement. And going along with that, I, I've, I've often said on this channel, like, regardless of your politics or your personal preferences or, or what you believe is the truth, all I can ask of you is don't make it worse. You know, the world is messed up enough in many ways. 
there's good in it, there's bad in it, there's eh in it, but just don't make it worse. If at the end of the day you can say, I didn't make it worse, I didn't suck, <laughs> I think you're, you're, you're ahead of the game. Yeah. And that's, that's all we can really ask of, of, of all of each other, really. Um, cool. A couple more questions. All right. Wanted to uh, talk gear. Uh, now, you're not a drummer, so it won't take an hour. So, wanted to find out, what do you rock when, I, I didn't really pay attention to what kind of guitar you were uh, playing, but what, uh, what do you rock at a show? Uh, I have a couple of guitars. The one that I had upstairs is my J45, Gibson J45. Mm -hmm. And that that's my workhorse. And that has a, it has a ding in it from an elk antler. Um, whoa, 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 back up. What's the story? <laughs> it's not, it's not, not a major story, but I have a dream catcher that has an elk antler. Okay, and okay. I ended up catching that. Darn, I and I, no, I didn't get It was all I had to but, defend myself. <laughs> but but on, my, on this journey... In the beginning of my book, on my audio book, mm -hmm. which check it out if you want to, the journey home, Carl John, the journey home, but it's on Audible and that has the music with it and the story. And I think it's a better experience, especially if you're a road dog and you're out driving at night and you want to hear something. Um, anyhow, uh, there's a there's an elk period in there, but my J forty five is named Liberty. Nice and. Uh, Liberty, Liberty was actually named after, uh, when I was 15 years old, I went out to Lake Havasu and I was from Indiana and there was a girl there named Liberty and she had her black hair spiked up like this. And when she didn't have it spiked up, it went over her eye like this. She didn't look like any of the girls in Indiana. <laughs> and we had this like great experience of like this chemistry and we just shared a kiss. That was it. But she made me a mixtape of wow. you know, all these bands so she was my she's like you know the original muse for me you know and yeah. she's like um she was she was you know this a, amazing experience perfectly captured you know and that that grew my artistry in a way nice. and you know so my guitar the name after that's where liberty came from uh oh does she know this I've never seen her again. I was 15 years well, old. I doubt she's watching this, but if you <laughs> are, there you go, Liberty. And now you know the fans. Um, I, that's a good story. What, and the other guitar, what, that's what you generally play at a show? Yeah, generally. I, I, have, a, I have another Fender acoustic uh, that, I, that I play. Um, I play percussion. I play cajon. I play hand drums. I play you know that type of thing. Um, that's right. You do play drums, a drum set as well. Yeah, yeah that's right. Well, forget what I said about drum, drummers then. <laughs> well, yeah, but the thing is, I, I don't really play the, you know, but I, I'm percussive. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty stripped down for the most part, you know. It's like I'm not a big gearhead, and I don't, you know. Um, you don't have any pedals? Yeah, why? Yeah. A, a tuner pedal? I, I have, well, I, I, I um, do have a preamp, you know, that I use, mm -hmm. and I, um, you know, sometimes tone that and, and then of course my tuner and you know other yeah. than that it's pretty it's pretty line in yeah but acoustically that I, I tend to I've always believed like if I can't make it sound like I want without a pedal then why am I you know what am I doing wrong yeah and if I want to fill it I'm going to fill it with the cats around me yeah, yeah I'm exactly. like with a trumpet player I've heard you know all this stuff and it's like really uh, fills the sound because I have sounds in my head right. it's like anything we played upstairs it's like and other stuff that I've written, it's like, I I have, uh, you know, the way I hear it is this whole other thing happening when I want to actually produce it. Right. You know? Yeah. I And, and I I have a guitar that is a, a beater, and uh, coincidentally, it's, it's a Freedom guitar. Brand. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It, there, was a, there was a store, and there was a store, I don't know if it still exists, there was a store in San Diego called Freedom Guitars, and if you look inside the F-hole, there's a sticker that says Freedom Guitars. As far as I know, they, they at least assembled it. I don't know if they build, build them there themselves. Um, but it was my first ever acoustic ever, first ever guitar. And uh, I remember it was like 88 bucks because they made, you know, they, yeah. it was theirs. And I, I remember taking the check and being like, I'm going to buy a guitar. <laughs> and I still have it. And it's it's not electric acoustic. It's just plain old, no, no cutaway. It's just a beater. It, it stays in tune. Mostly. The G string rides up a little. It's Vegas, <laughs> but uh, 
yeah, anytime I, I want to like write a song and, and really feel like, how good is the song? I, I write, I play it on that. Nice. And, and that tells me, okay, I got work to do or, or okay, there's some solid hit, you know, beats on this, that, that solid moments. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Last question. You made it. Great. Let's pretend we're talking to little Carl John. Let's, no. Carl John. Well, yeah, this doesn't actually, I normally ask this question because everybody's like, oh, I, you know, 12 years old, 10 years old, whatever. But you came to it kind of, after second grade, you came to it later in life, mm-hmm. really. So let's pretend we're talking to Carl who said, hey, I can do that. I want to start thinking about making music and doing that. What's one thing you wish someone had told you when you started out making music? Well, first off, I wish I wish somebody uh, told me when I was a kid that that was a possibility. You know, uh, encouraged that, you know, I like to sing. Mm-hmm. You know, that there's technique to it and there's you're just going to learn some things maybe as well and learn to play guitar and this, you know. Um, and that wasn't there and it wasn't by any fault of anybody. It might even come from a musical family. They appreciate music, but no one plays. Right. You know, except my grandfather, which my was my adopted grandfather, Carl, who played the accordion and played organ. He's the one who first taught me how to play any instrument at all. It was the organ. Um, you know, but had I thought like I had anything to offer, um, I would have definitely jumped in that earlier instead of sitting on the curb Mm -hmm. looking in. And that's why I felt like, you know, a lot of times, so I probably would have, you know, offered that. And then the second thing, if someone just approached me later when I first started, um, don't trip about the songs the process of writing because becoming a songwriter became painful it's like becoming an author became it was like a painful experience of like burying your soul but when you worry about it too much you get in the way of yourself right. and it's like some songs like when i did bittersweet goodbye that came out over the course of a relationship i'd been writing the whole song for a year and a half mm-hmm. right it was like, you know, the, the relationship's really great, and then it gets slightly worse, and slightly, right? And it's like, you know it's on the it's going to end at some point, you know, right? Yeah. And it's like, and then the, the relationship finally ended, and I finished the song because it became true to me. Put the nail in the coffin, and it became true. And it's like, other songs come out in a, in a breath. They come out when you want to say the thing that you want to say. Like, all three songs I played at the Artisan last week were songs that I was saying the thing I wanted to say in that moment. And then it just came out. And then the other ones just have to be pulled from you. And you have to grow through the experience. And so to not worry about it, to know that's part of the journey uh, of an artist, you know, and becoming a painter, becoming all these things that has been like something that's like, don't worry about it, just do it. Right. Right. And it will it will become um, obvious what it is when it's in front of you complete. Well said. I, I couldn't say it any better. Um, yeah, Carl John ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for watching. Stick around. We're gonna get a few songs from him up in room six, which may or may not have happened beforehand. And um, <laughs> and like I said, there is a link in the description for the uh, showcase where we met. Uh, the live stream of that, uh, and I'll have a link for the upcoming showcase as well. By the time this posts, I'll probably be a couple showcases in here. It's a weekly thing. Every Wednesday, 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time at the Artisan Hotel if you're in town, or live stream on YouTube right here on the channel. Um, yeah, definitely check out the album and the book and the audiobook, The Journey Home. Home? Journey Home. 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 I'm not a mistake. And um, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you upstairs in room six. Uh, temporarily say goodbye. Bye. This is hard like a wheel.
was driving through no folk city two more hours and I'll cross that interstate line it ain't easy to run from yourself I've been driving so long now I can hardly tell Black wheel of soul undiscovered A few more haunted miles That'll cross my mind And if that road that brought me here Won't bring me back again I lay down on that road And I'll say goodbye Life I'm living has left me without knowing. Had a road not taken, it's overtaken me. I catch my reflection staring from the rear view. Man, there's no running from who you mean to be. So undiscovered, a few more haunted miles that have crossed my mind. And if that road that brought me here won't bring me back again, I lay down on that road. So undiscovered, a few more haunted miles that'll cross my mind. And if that road that brought me here won't bring me back again, I'll lay down on that road and I'll say goodbye. And I'll lay down on that road and I'll say I'll say goodbye. I say goodbye. I'll say goodbye. Dallas is beautiful, but at the age of 43, 10 lines from a neon sign left her faded with the dreams. But she wasn't gonna rust there like the city limit sign. Stuck somewhere in neutral between the, the bourbon and the wine. Time goes by getting ready to fly, living too afraid to fall. With an autumn frost, the whole life lost, it's a photo on the wall. Let your dreams fall apart, and it seems they slowly fade away. It's like hot just sticks on Route 66 at the Golden Light Cafe. Now a barstool dreamer, the other side of prime. Her old regrets are all that's left, but clouding up her mind. A life not spent on living, a heart that's put on pause. Gone from all that might have been to has been and never was. 
I get ready to fly, living too afraid to fall. With an autumn frost, the whole life lost, the photo on the wall. You let your dreams fall apart, and it seems they slowly fade away. The clock just sticks on Route 66 at the Golden Light Cafe. Watching the time tick past, you find out much too late. It's all of your tomorrows that become your yesterdays. As time goes by, getting ready to fly, living. Free to fall, and with an autumn frost, a whole life lost. It's the photo on the wall. You let your dreams fall apart, and it seems they slowly fade away. It's like clock just sticks on Route 66 at the Golden Light Cafe. The like clock just sticks down on Route 66 at the Golden Light Cafe. This is bittersweet goodbye. Well, I won't play the fool again. Caught up in your right. This road ends. I walked in now a thousand times. Though we wish that it were not the case, the way it is ain't supposed to be. We can end this with a warm embrace. A familiar tragedy. So when the tears replace the laughter, and you're happily ever after, and your heart is whole now for one last try. Well, sometimes love's a bit of sweet goodbye. And trapped inside a memory. Two lost souls still intertwined And though your siren song still tempts me I've grown tired of lullabies I only wish that it were not the case The way it is ain't supposed to be We can end this with a warm embrace or a familiar tragedy so When the tears replace the laughter And you're happily ever after And your heart is holding out for one last try well, Sometimes love's a bit of sweet goodbye Home to the hand we know Too afraid to be set free Maybe somewhere down two different roads You find it's where we're meant to be When the tears replace the laughter You're happily ever after And your heart is holding out for one last try Still you have to go your own way In the hopes that maybe someday Well sometime love's a bit of sweet goodbye Sometime love's a bit of sweet goodbye 
Sometimes love's a bittersweet goodbye. This is home. We are one. today I've been asleep too long I dreamt too long lost nights and days Those whispered words come and gone They used to say we are one The earth, the moon and the sun Dark and light Wrong in the right, making our way back home With the heartbeat of another We're sisters and we're brothers and Formed of different colors, our souls are all the same It's a grand illusion Step out of confusion Let go of fear and hate There's no room to wait, we are one Sun, dark and light, wrong and the right, picking our way back home. We are one. The earth, the moon, and the sun. Dark and light, wrong and the right, picking our way back home. On this mirror's tragic end and Each heart shining bright The other one to see Love your whole truth Let your soul be free And then you'll see we are one The earth, the moon, and the sun Dark and light, wrong and the right Making our way back home We are one Dark and light, wrong and the right, making our way back home. We are one, we are one, making our way back home. We are, we are one, we are one, the earth, the moon, and the sun. Dark and light, wrong and the right, making our way back home. Making a way back home. I want to thank Carl John for dropping by. It was a great interview and a great performance. If you want to see more from him, check the link down in the description. I have all his social media there, and you also can check him out at the first songwriters showcase over at the Artisan. Uh, other than that, if you want to be on this channel, whether reviewed, interviewed, or both, hit me up using my social media link down there. Also ways you can support the channel, Room 6 merch, Patreon page, all that jazz. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this, click up there. And if you'd like to subscribe to the channel, it would really make a difference. Please click down there and don't forget to ring the bell. Remember to be amazing, and we'll see you next time on Room 6. Say goodbye. Goodbye. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba.